chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh, and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with me. Hey, everyone. Today, we've got AJ Kumar, the digital maestro. AJ is the founder of The Limitless Company, a studio system for influencers. So AJ and his team are on a mission to help entrepreneurs in the creative economy build for-profit human healing brands. AJ has helped corporate brands like Salesforce, Mint, Intuit, and industry personal brands, including Neil Patel, Nikki Haskell, and Kimberly Snyder. <laughs> so AJ, great to have you. First of all, where in the world are you? Well, first, thanks for having me, Nick. I really appreciate it. I'm here in Los Angeles. Okay. I'm, and the weather... pretty, close to, I'm pretty close to the Hollywood sign, actually. It's just, uh, just a couple blocks down. Ah, awesome. So today we've got a couple of topics to go through. And I thought a nice starting point would just be to, to get to know you a little bit and understand your, your backstory and where you are today. So let's maybe go into how you got into SEO and building brands and building personality brands over to you. Perfect. Well, that sounds really good. So today I'm, I call myself the digital maestro and I work with clients to create viral ver worthy attention. And we help our clients, you know, maximize and create value from that attention. We have something that we've created called ROAC, return on attention created. And that helps us measure the success of our content creation habits. So I've been in digital marketing, social media for over 15 years now. Uh, a while back, like in 2008, 2009, I came from this background where I had a cousin that was a, a successful mortgage guru. And he taught me a lot of real world skills. And then I had a, a buddy that I knew from high school who became a mentor of mine, Neil Patel who started teaching me digital world skills. And about 2009, 2010, he introduced me to his cousin, Sujin Patel, and we started a company called Single Grain. And Single Grain was, was essentially an SEO company where we focus primarily on search engine optimization, specifically for Google, and we work with a lot of corporate brands. So I did that for a little while and helped grow the company from you know, 100,000, 200,000 um, a year to over a couple million dollars a year. And then I did that for a bit, but then I started to gravitate away from working with corporate brands and started gravitating towards personal brands. So I ended up getting bought out and I shifted into a new direction. I partnered with a woman named Kimberly Snyder at that time. I helped her co-found her business from around 2012 to 2015. And from there, it was just remarkable because I figured out how to apply corporate digital marketing strategies to a person, to a human, and helped her take her little blog that was getting like 30,000 visitors a month at that time to over 500,000 visitors a month from search traffic, from social media. And that resulted in a multitude of successes, including three New York Times bestselling books for her, a multi-million dollar business, sold digital products, physical products. I basically helped create the infrastructure for what's now referred to as a personality-driven media company. And based off of the blueprint that I designed for her, I started doing that with other people. I had TV stars that I helped do that with. And then in 2020, I rebranded my company uh, from originally it was called The Limitless Publishing Inc. and then rebranded it to The Limitless Company. There was a lot of, you know, this was around the time that pandemic happened and just the whole world changed. And I shifted from working with my clients on things like blogging to video. And I was doing, I started getting into video like 2018, 2019, because I could see that everything was shifting in that direction anyways. So that led me to the Lamellis company. And now we're, we're an end-to-end -end studio system for influencers. And we essentially help our clients and, and position them as gurus in the marketplace. You talk about taking some of the learnings that you developed with Kimberly and using that with new clients. How easy is it to replicate what you did with Kimberly? I mean, that also, also I'm sure was not an overnight success. That would have taken not a month or two. That would have taken a couple of years to become an, an overnight success. That's, that's something that I, that I often, often comment on. 
folks will want to go online and buy this. Here are five easy steps for you to become an internet sensation. How true is that? Like a lot of the, a lot of, yeah, that stuff doesn't work in general. Like I've been doing this for 15 years and even I've, I've had relationships with like people that taught me things and, and helped me learn things. Even for Kimberly, when I helped her become that New York Times bestselling author for the first time, that was a strategy I learned from a mentor of mine. So like Neil introduced me to a lot of really amazing people at that time. There was a guy, Tim Ferriss, who a lot of people know. So I met up with Tim and Tim taught me the, the strategies of how to market books in the modern age using digital media. And taking a page out of his playbook, I applied it to Kim and it worked. And then, you know, she was able to replicate it a bunch of times. And then now it became like a thing that a lot of authors started using, which is essentially the idea of giving people more value, give, creating more perceived value so that people buy something as a pre-order instead of waiting, at, waiting for it to happen, right? Because that's how the New York Times bestseller algorithm works, where you basically have seven days to sell a high volume of books from a variety of retailers. So the best time to accomplish that would be the pre-sell period. Yeah. One of the points you bring up is networking. And it sounds like you have built up a, a mentorship network, but also a network in the, in, in the industry. How important has, has, have mentors been in your journey? Huge. I mean, I have a book coming out called Guru Inc., which is essentially about how I grew up I, I didn't go to, I ended up going to college for a couple semesters and then I dropped out. And then from then on, I've always had some kind of mentor or a guru, as I call it. I'm Indian, so I have an Indian background of growing up in an environment where we literally went to go see a spiritual guru. And then over time, I realized in America, you know, the gurus are in business, they're in different industries. And as I realized that, I've always just gravitated towards that. I've had this philosophy when I was working at this, at this company called the Mike Ferry Organization, which was a, a sales training company for real estate agents, where you become the average of the people that you surround yourself with. So I've, I've consciously always surrounded myself with successful people. And by success, I'm not saying they have to be super rich or wealthy. I'm saying it's, it's someone that that wants to accomplish, that is accomplishing things. They're a high achiever. And by putting myself around those people, it naturally got me to, to raise my skills. Like, I don't know if you play tennis or, or sports or anything like that, but like when you play tennis and you play with somebody that's way better than you, then you'll perform a lot better. If you play with somebody that's a lot worse than you, then you'll play somewhere similar at that level. And at least you wouldn't, you wouldn't get better. So I've kind of taken that to heart and I apply that to work where I like to surround myself with people that are really successful, that are doing really well and learn from them and, and apply what I can to what I'm doing. Well, I think that's a great life lesson. And I love that analogy of tennis. I, my son plays tennis. We play a whole bunch of sports and yeah, you always push yourself up to that next level when you can see, you know, it's possible and other, and other folks are doing it. Talking yeah. about pushing yourself. You said you haven't got a, a college degree. You've done, you've done a couple of semesters of work. Talk to me about some of the interesting jobs that you've done in your past that have given you the foundation for where you are now. And I'll, and I'll give that a little bit of additional covering. You've worked in telesales. You've done the speaker circuit. You've done marketing. consulting, marketing. Agency. Agencies. Yeah. A lot of folks go into a specific job or role and think, wow, this is never going to be useful for me later in my life. So it's about saying, how did your work in retail, telesales, et cetera, influence your, your working style and habits now? Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's really good, especially because now we are in a, in a digital world first environment. And it was interesting for me because, uh, you know, I think it was around 17, went to college for a couple of semesters. I had a, I was in a relationship with this girl and we broke up. It was my, like my first girlfriend. I had a heartache and I just didn't want to be in school anymore. It just wasn't working for me. I was originally trying to study marketing and sales, but I, 
I wasn't even in like a bunch of marketing classes. I had to take all the prerequisites. So I didn't even get to get really far in that. And then I had this cousin that was really successful in, in mortgage sales. And, and he introduced me to a company that he was a coach for. It was called the Mike Ferry Organization. And that's when I first got the job of telesales. Prior to that, I was actually fairly like shy-ish. So I actually took that job in, in that, hey, I want to change my life. I want to do something different because, you know, I broke up with that girl. I you know, didn't feel that great. So I wanted, to, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to put myself in an uncomfortable situation. And that was sales. That was talking to people, especially the environment that I got put in. I was 17, 18 years old talking to 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, and essentially getting them to take their credit card out of their wallet, read me the number over the phone so I could charge them for a ticket that they would use to go to a seminar where they could learn sales skills, kind of like how I'm demonstrating with them on the phone. So you're talking about putting yourself out of your comfort zone. Telesales must be the least comfortable place to be because the, the rejection rate must be, must be quite high there. But how have you taken some of the learnings from telesales into digital marketing? Are there any similarities? Because telesales perhaps is a bit more old school and SEO, digital marketing now is the, is the new thing. What has carried over? Yeah, one thing I noticed, I think this was around 2013, 14, 15, I just started noticing the similarities of physical world jobs and like digital world jobs. What it reminded me, like the, the activities that I would do in telesales reminded me a lot of how landing pages work. Like essentially, you know, I was one of 50, 60 people in a room of salespeople that were dialing, talking, dialing, talking. Whereas in the digital space, it's like you create one landing page. I mean, there's a series of videos and there's some kind of funnel to some respect, but essentially becomes like a virtual salesperson. So now you could just drive traffic to this one thing and then optimize this one thing in order to increase conversions. Whereas on the phone, you still got to make a high volume of calls. You got you to alter the way you use your tonality. You got to alter the words that you use or the body language. Like your body's an instrument. And the more finely tuned it is, the more successful you're going to be with harmonizing with somebody over the phone. Similarly, in the online space, you know, you, you have visuals that you could use, you have written copy that you could use. So a lot of, a lot of like how I got into the online space was, was translating my skills of sales into copywriting. Right. And then I would copyright for, I would copyright for different businesses, creating little descriptions or e-commerce descriptions or, or, or whatnot. And that over time helped me create landing pages, ads, full marketing campaigns, branding campaigns. So a lot of the, a lot of what I took from my past had to do with people, relationships, how you talk with people one-to-one -one, and then translating that on how you could do that through a computer or through a phone, right? Because it doesn't translate the same way. Even when I was doing phone sales, the idea would be to add extra energy and extra enthusiasm to every conversation. Because when you're talking on the phone, not everything is being transmitted 100%. Like all that energy isn't there, so you have to up it. So the same thing applies with, with online. Even when I'm talking with clients and they're filming content, it seems a little counterintuitive at first, but you got to give like 120% energy and enthusiasm because once you look at the video, you'll see that not everything translates 100%. It's, it's interesting seeing the similarities from... from us slightly older guys who've been in the industry for 15, 15, 20 years, and the importance of good copy or good writing. And I think with ChatGPT and AI, a lot of good content is out there, but it's not necessarily going to catch people's attention, catch people's attention as well as, for example, a, a, a phone call of somebody who's got real experience understanding their, their customers. So I think that content written by people who really know their customer, like for example, yourself is actually spoken to hundreds, possibly thousands of customers is an absolutely valuable skill. So any of, any of you out there who are stuck in a job where you are repeating content and having to speak to people on the phone, 
don't worry, it will be very valuable for you later in your life because everything that you do in any role is going to be value at some stage. Now, you chat about content creation. Let's go back to your, to your current business and talk to me about mm -hmm. the kind of content that you produce and where do you see content going? Is it, is it more voice? Is it more videos? Is it short videos, long form podcast? What is the hottest thing right now? Yeah, I love that question because I'm I'm so enthusiastic and excited about short form vertical video content for social media. Now, it's it's like I've been diving really deep into this because you've probably heard of this concept of how social media channels have kind of shifted from this social graph to this interest based graph. And trying to understand that there's this big shift that happened in the last few years. TikTok was one of the first platforms to really introduce this concept at such a high level. And a lot of it was because we just didn't have the technology, the bandwidth to be able to process all those video files. But once that did occur, it didn't take long for everybody to, to hop on that train and jump on. Now we're, now we're living in a time where people are on their phones three, four hours a day. A majority of that time is on social media. And a majority of that time is consuming short form content and people are consuming content like similarly to the way food works, where they're consuming it, they're consuming it over and over again. And it's like people are consuming 100, 200, 300 videos per day. So when we're creating content with clients, it's not so much about like, oh, I'm just going to get this one video and have them try to remember it. We're telling a much more a, a bigger narrative that occurs over a longer period of time. I use, I use an example or a metaphor of, you ever seen one of those flip books where there's like a, a picture on each page and then when you flip it, it starts to make these different motions? So it's similarly, similarly to how I see content, if we're posting videos every single day, then over time, what we're really doing is we're positioning the brand, whether it's a person or, or corporate brand or a person that represents a corporate brand, and we're position, positioning them in the minds of these viewers as an authority on that subject matter and that topic. And the viewer doesn't really know, but you're building this subconscious connection with them where they develop what's referred to as a parasocial relationship. It's a one-way relationship where they feel like they know you. They feel like they're connected with you, even though you may not have ever even seen them before, right? With a lot of my clients that I work with, I typically work with people that are subject matter experts, they're thought leaders, they're somebody that's at the top of their game and it help them market that and then position that, position them in a way where it's very subtle. But my goal with clients is to take them from being just a leader in their industry to being a leader for their industry, where they start to represent their industry to the outside world, right? Like that's what I did with Kimberly. And there's certain ways to do it where most people are niching down, right? Which is how you build authority. You get really good at a, at a subject matter and you niche down. But then I realized that when I'm looking at the greats, and when I'm talking about the greats in the last 30, 40 years, I'm talking about the people that have built really substant, like really successful media companies like the Oprah's, the Ellen's, the Martha Stewart's, and so on and so forth. Regardless of how people feel about them today, they essentially have this, have this playbook figured out where they're creating content, they're positioning themselves in the way where they're not just talking about one area of expertise, but they're talking about multiple. So I essentially came up with this concept called niche blending, right? So let me ask you this. What happens when you get table tennis, badminton, and tennis, and you put them all together? Uh, you get a variety of different instruments that you've got to, that you've got to learn. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you get pickleball. Right. Okay. You, you, you get a brand new sport that like that has existed in the in a faint background. But today that those combinations of those of those different interests turn into one thing. So if if you're a content creator today and you're trying to stand out, the idea is, yeah, you want to niche down to find a core focus, but then you want to start to niche blend to mix other interests that you have together. Right. Because as people, we are interested in a variety of different things. And the creativity, the art of what you do is how you could blend those things together and then present them in a way which makes you different than other people in your niche. Like with Kimberly, she was a plant-based nutritionist. 
but she had other areas of interest like spirituality, like yoga. And by taking these other areas of interest, now you start to appeal to different audiences in these different areas of interest. And then, you know, a person in yoga naturally starts to have an interest in plant-based nutrition, but they may not have been in the plant-based nutrition bucket before, right? So you start to create all these new ways for people to discover you. And that's what the social media landscape is today. It's a variety of different interest-based spaces. And the, the, main in, the main interests tend to be much more difficult to compete with. So that's why when you could merge other interests together and blend it together, you're much more likely to stand out. Well, it's interesting because I've, we've had a couple of experiments with clients as well where they are very niche focused, but then they talk about what's in their kitchen. They talk about their weekend. And very often those sort of more personal types of engagements have gotten way higher engagement than their product focused or niche focused content. And I think that's because, like you said, somebody's plant-based focused, but they also drive a car. They also have to use the bank. They also have to do use a washing machine, et cetera. And those are things that regular people have. So I think, I think that's a, a good way that you, with the pickleball, by the way, I don't even know what pickleball is and I don't think I've ever seen it. So, so that, oh, <laughs> so if I, you're, in, I, you're in for a tree. <laughs> So it is a mix of those, and it's like one of the fastest growing sports today. And the amount of attention it's getting and the size of the industry of pickleball is becoming its own universe, right? Well, LeBron cool just invested in the pickleball team. Really? Well, I'm going to have to go onto YouTube and check, and check that out. <laughs> yeah. Now, you talk about creating content, niches, etc. And I want to talk quickly about the difference between organic reach and paid reach. So using Google ads or paying for adverts on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. For your clients like Kimberly or any new clients, do you have a ratio of how much organic growth you want or organic content you want versus paid content? And what do, how does that work for you? What has worked successfully for you? Yeah, so I noticed that a lot of, a lot of people in the last, like I would say 10 or so years, didn't really give that much attention to social media in that, you know, they bought followers or they just thought of it as vanity metrics and whatnot. And then it was just in the last couple of years where these new mechanisms for discovery came about that made it so more traffic was possible. Whereas before it was very slow growth. So when I, when I talk to people about the difference, you have the advertising ecosystem and then you have the organic ecosystem. People are in a different state of being when they're in either or systems. Where in, where, when in the ad ecosystem, people are typically a lot more guarded. They're, they're a little bit more impatient. They're more distracted, right? Because that's just how they've been trained to since they've been watching television. You don't really want to watch commercials. That's why DVR then came about and TiVo and, and then eventually streaming. And then it kind of made its full circle to where now even streaming companies have ads in between the, in the content. But it, it essentially comes to show that the organic ecosystem is something that is going on always in the present moment. It's happening now. Like right now, there are millions and millions of videos being uploaded and shared, billions even, right? And that's always happening. So when, I, when it's like, I have this strategy, which I call the 3C framework, which is content and commerce in concert. Content is what you start to put out there to put your brand into the minds of people. And this is all value-based. It's like, what kind of value can you deliver to your audience? How could you give them a better viewing experience? Because all these social media platforms have different viewing experiences. A lot of people are used to the feed experience on Instagram, but there's also the story experience. If you want to nurture your existing followers, then the story experience does a really great job at that. If you want to reach more non-followers, then the feed experience is going to help you accomplish that. So by, by understanding that there's, uh, there's a different state of being that people are in, you create content where you're giving them value in the organic environment, you're building that relationship, then it makes it so that when you start providing ads, when you start to commercialize um, the content that people are watching, it becomes a lot it becomes a lot more of an easier transition. It's not as cold, right? Especially as we're going into this cookie-less world where tracking and privacy are a priority for a lot of companies today. 
it's going to just make it that much harder to reach people through advertising. It's not that it can't be done. It's just going to be much more challenging. So that's why I'm even noticing a lot more brands are putting more attention to the organic environment because you could build real relationships with them. There's some new interesting technology coming out, which is trying to take advantage, well, which is trying to stay ahead of this trend of people putting lots of doing gatekeeping with, with regards to cookies and with regards to hard sales. And it's things like Pinterest where on images, you can click on the images or part of the image. And if you like that shirt in blue, you can click and get that, that shirt in blue. And the same thing on Instagram. And I think YouTube is bringing it up. And a couple of smart TVs now also allow you to buy directly off the screen. Have you started working in any of these technologies and have uh, any of them working for you? A lot of the on-shopping experiences I've not. A lot of the clients that I, that I work with, they typically have some kind of client-facing business of some sort, not necessarily selling e-commerce products. But I am noticing that a lot as well. Like even with TikTok, TikTok is prioritizing people that are selling and using TikTok shop, right? It's almost like Amazon tried launching their social network where people are slowly starting to share some content, but I don't think it's worked as well as what TikTok is doing. For them, they were this social network first, and now they're integrating the shopping experience. So you could kind of see that they're trying to dominate in that respect because people are becoming a lot more comfortable with making these purchases off videos that they see, right? And if, I don't know if you ever bought anything from the TikTok shop before, but it's pretty seamless. Like, it's really sweet. Well, that's where technologies like your Shopify's, websites like Shopify are, again, taking advantage of these trends. They've just got every single plugin possible that you can think of to, with all of, the, with all of these changes. Sorry, I've got a cat on my lap. So my, <laughs> hello, hello What's your cat's cat. name? This is Aladdin. And he oh, scratches that. at my door if I don't let him in. Are you being a naughty cat? <laughs> yes. Okay. So the, the listeners on the podcast won't be able to see this, but those on YouTube will. Are there any exciting new technologies that you are using for your business? And this could be in terms of improving your Google advertising or your, or your, your ad processes or things like video production. Yeah. So the thing that's really exciting to me. I mean, a lot, everyone has access to AI. I'm utilizing AI in, in, whatever, like in a way that I think is pretty awesome. It's obviously, for me, it's speeding up a lot of the ideas or concepts that I have. And I think that's really important because I work with a lot of people that are educators. They're, they're teaching something. They have their own frameworks or messages. And by utilizing AI, it's easier for me to repackage that information and make things a little bit more marketable or memorable. There's a new plugin I started using with ChatGPT. It's called Whimsical Plugins. Okay. And you know, when you're working in the AI space, I mean, so when you're working in the digital space, everything's behind a screen, everything's behind a computer, right? So it could get difficult trying to imagine all the different parts and pieces of all the things that are going on. So you need things like flowcharts, you need things like organization in order to have these systems that could help you create that content consistently for a long period of time, right? Because consistency becomes a really big part of it. So I've been using AI and whether it's like ChatGPT or Claude, as well as project management systems like ClickUp, and I'm designing this infrastructure that is allowing us to create content at scale, but not just any content, a high quality content where we're focusing on key areas that are made for retention, that are like designed for retention, right? So it's like script writing or editing. We have unique processes that we use for that just because we care so much about every second that we keep somebody on the video. Because an accumul accumulatively, if that's a word, all of that goes into increasing all the metrics. Yeah. Some interesting technology that you've just spoken about there. How do you keep on top of trends? Because this is an industry, I teach digital marketing and every day I'm learning, I find five new AI tools, I find five new plugins on Adobe Premiere Pro, on Canva brings out new things the whole time. How do you filter out 
where do you find your information and uh, how do you filter out the trash from the from the good stuff that's a good question because i think we're all in this place right now where there is an information overload the amount of ai products that are coming out are coming out at such fast speed and it's only getting faster so part of it is as i come across new tools i definitely test it out whether it's me or somebody on my team i have somebody test it out to see if it makes sense in our process. Like we have a, a process for everything that we do and if it could improve it in some way or shape or form, I'm all about that. But at the same time, I don't get, I, I don't allow that to distract me because at the end of the day, there's still the doing of the work. Like the work still needs to get done. And when there's this tool to try, that tool to try, moving things to this, moving things to that, like I've had this experience, which I'm sure a lot of people in digital marketing and, and the digital world could relate to, where you use this project management software and then you move everything to the next one and to the next one because the next one's supposed to be easier. So I used to do a lot of that before, just trying to find that. But instead, I just found one thing and just made that thing work. And now, that, now I just keep doing that thing. And then if new things come about, we test it, but we're not trying to like apply everything because that's just going to break systems down. Yeah, it's got to be real good for you to move over. I've, I've had that experience as well with a lot of technologies. It's, it's, it's essentially part of like a decision making process, right? Because that's what becomes really, really, really important is like, what's the criteria for the way you're making decisions for the new tools or apps that you're trying to apply? And you got to really be imaginative, imaginative and think it through and really evaluate it before you try to integrate it into your, into your systems and process. Yeah, it's quite easy to be distracted by the, the, the bright, shiny new thing. And I think so a, lot of a lot of people get distracted by that. And a very good example of how to avoid this was Descript, which is a software that, that we use for editing podcasts and uh, exporting podcasts. And they seem to be quite late in the game on bringing in AI products. And they said exactly what you said hey, we could have added in 50 new plugins to try and stay ahead of the game and make us look like, we're, like we are on, 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 top of the AI, on top of an AI game. But they said, we wanted to make sure that it all worked properly, that it integrates with our system and that we give you the best possible service and, and product. And I really like that they were very open with that. They're saying, hey, we're not going to add 50 new things. Only when it's ready and it works are we going to stick it in. And I think, and that's why, they keep my money and I won't <laughs> move somewhere else because, because of that kind of statement, which I, which I really liked. Other yeah, solid product. The last thing I want to talk to you about is, is there something interesting about you that we possibly don't know or that wasn't on the multiple blogs that I read about you, other than perhaps pickleball? The most interesting thing that, that, I'm, that I'd say that's happening in my world right now is this, is this concept it's a methodology that I've been working on that I've, I've co-created with my business mentor, a guy named Roy Camarano. It's, it's a method called ROWOC, Return on Attention Created. And it's, it's just this fascinating thing that I've, been, that I've been thinking about and developing and working on and applying with my clients. And it's, it's all about understanding the qualitative and quantitative feedback of the attention that we're creating. There was this article by United Nations that happened in the last couple of years that's talking about how the attention economy is worth trillions and trillions of dollars, right? People are talking about the creator economy. The creator economy essentially was birthed from the attention economy. And it's like attention is such an, el an elusive, complicated thing that I've been really excited about just trying to pin it down because a, a big challenge I've had throughout my career was Hey, I'm creating all this content, but sometimes people view content creation as something commoditized as like, oh, you're just, you're just, you know, you're typing some words or you're just editing some videos. But to me, I always saw a much bigger picture because when I'm working with clients, it's not just about, you know, here's a video or here's a blog post. The big picture is how am I monetizing this attention? How am I, how am I creating value from this attention? So for a lot of my clients, I've had four clients I've gotten TV shows. I have clients that get speaking gigs, brand deals. And that's all something that doesn't happen right away because when it comes to content creation, a lot of people think it's black and white, like they invest this much and they get this much out of it right away. But it's a much more longer game. 
So return on attention created is, uh, is something that's just been exciting to play with and see how we could introduce it to the world. I love that you talk about value and what I talk to my students about with every piece of content that they are creating is that what value is this giving to a customer? Is it information? Is it education? Is it entertainment? There's got to be some value add to the customer and that helps you filter out the trash thoughts and all the trash ideas and the, and the good ideas. So I, I really, and I, I think that concept of yours is, is very good and I'm sure Big data can tie into that as well, but we won't go into a big data dis discussion today. <laughs> Where can I send folks to learn a bit more about you, AJ? Yeah, you could reach me at AJ the Digital Maestro on Instagram. Cool. I'll put that up in the links and send folks through to that. Well, AJ, Amazing. thank you so much for your time. It's been very interesting hearing about your business, a bit of your backstory and about pickleball and uh, that you also got to meet our other studio guest, Aladdin. Thank you so much, AJ. Thanks for having me, Nick. Appreciate it. Come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh.